pilgrims on a journey. Well, this morning we continue on in, uh, in our journey through these songs on the road. If you have your Bible, you can open it up to Psalm 122. Right about in the middle, if you open your Bible up in the middle, you'll be in the Psalms. And then just turn forward to Psalm 122. We started this journey a couple weeks ago in Psalm 120. And we walked through 121. And now... We've arrived. This, uh, this psalm is in Jerusalem, in God's presence. And the theme of this psalm is worship. That, that being in God's presence is joyful. That worship is a party. Now, a couple years ago, I, I took a, a, a group of youth down to Guatemala to serve with Impact Ministries. Uh, it, was, uh, it was great to see what the Lord was doing there. Uh, and now, the situation in Impact uh, or in Guatemala is that kids uh, usually can go to school till about grade one and grade two, and then they have to go and work in the fields. They have to make an income to help support their family so that their family can eat. And Les and Rita Peters went down there, and they wanted to make a difference. So they built a school, K-7, to in a little village called Taktik. And, and this school um, would serve then on Sundays as a gathering place. And they gathered money to, uh, to sponsor families so that they could send their kids to receive an education and to learn about Jesus. And God blessed the work of their hands. Uh, over these 20 years, uh, communities have heard about this and are asking for schools to be built. There's several of these elementary schools. They built a high school. They've made a medical center. And in the last couple years, they made an orphanage where kids could be dropped off, brought up, loved. God has blessed the work of their hands with transformed lives transforming communities. And that's actually the, the ministry that we want to visit in February down in Guatemala, Impact. But what impacted me most about this was a worship service. It wasn't on Sunday. It was on Tuesday morning. See, every morning started off in the schools with, with praise and worship. And our team went in there, kind of bleary-eyed after a long night. You guys know how youth are. And, and we were ready to, you know, sing some songs. But these kids, they were filled with joy. They had their hands lifted high, their eyes closed, and they were singing for all they were worth. They were singing at the top of their lungs. They didn't have much. They didn't have a Nintendo Switch or, a, or an iPad or even a, a full lunch. But they had Jesus. And they knew that Jesus had them. And because of that, they sang. They worshipped. They celebrated God's presence. And that's the picture that we get in Psalm 122. See, back in Psalm 120, we started off in this Meshach in Kedar, in a foreign land, recognizing that we longed for peace, and the people around us wanted war. And so the pilgrim sets out. He packs his bags, and he hits the road. And it's a hard road. It's an uphill road. And as he's going through Roger's Pass, he realizes how big these mountains are and lifts his eyes higher than the mountains. Where does my help come from? The Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And here in Psalm 122, he's arrived in Jerusalem, in God's presence. And he is glad. It is a party. You see, worship, worship is being in the presence 
of God together. That's what worship is, and it is a party. But it takes effort to be there, right? These psalms are psalms of ascent. They're an uphill climb. It takes effort. Ask any mom. It takes effort to be here on a Sunday morning. Little kids, big kids, man kids. <laughs> Right? It takes effort to be here on a Sunday morning, and there are excuses not to come. Maybe you've heard some of them. My mom made me come. Well, your, your mom also made you go to sleep. That hasn't stopped you there. Uh, the church is full of hypocrites. Yeah, and there's room for one more. Come on and join us. <laughs> you know? Uh, it's too hot. Or it's too cold. Come on. We live in Saskatchewan. It's always too hot, too cold, too windy, too much hail. Hang on for 10 minutes. It'll change. I mean, this kind of weather is what makes us hardy people, right? Amen? Uh, we only get four nice days a year. And if it was one of those days, you'd say, well, I can't come to church because it's too nice a day. Excuses. Uh, it's, it's my one day to sleep in. Uh, the Seahawks are playing the early game. I, um, I connect better with God on the golf course or in nature. There's a better preacher I can hear on podcast. I, I don't feel like it. Excuses. Now... We could, uh, we could debunk these excuses, and you could see they're kind of flimsy. But instead of doing that, I want to concentrate on the one reason to come. Worship. Being in God's presence together. That's why. Now, before the Facebook lights up, we're glad you're here, <laughs> you're with us. I, I know there's legit reasons not to come. But we have to ask ourselves, is this legit or is this an excuse? And my prayer is as, as we get Psalm 122, or as the Psalm 122 gets us, that we will want to be in worship. So... You can open up your Bibles. The, uh, the psalmist sings a three-part harmony here on three reasons or three things that happen in the worship service. All right? And the first is that in worship, we enjoy God. In worship, we enjoy God. Verse 1, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. The first emotion here, glad. It's kind of a bland word, right? We don't use that very often. I feel glad today. So some people have translated it as excited. I, I jumped for joy. I would use the word I was fired up. I was fired up when I was in the house of the Lord. Man, it was a journey to get here. And there were some hard stretches. But to be in the presence of God, worth it all. You, you know this feeling. Some of you are going to, to travel to see family. East coast, west coast, Winnipeg. You're, you're traveling somewhere. You've got to get through high gas prices, road construction, airport lines. But when you see family, it's worth it all. That's the sentiment here. Uh, actually, he says... I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. He's looking back at what happened. Someone invited him. And that's a word for us. Someone invited him in. I, uh, I spoke to a woman who, whose husband had passed away and she was struggling with coming on Sunday mornings. She said, we were a team I could sit by him. We would go out afterwards. It's just not the same. And so she didn't come for a while. 
until a friend called her and invited her. Said she'd sit with her, take her out afterwards, even pick her up. And so she went. And uh, I, she said, she said it wasn't easy, but it was good. And I'm thankful for my friend who invited me. Church, are we, that's kind of where we are. There's some people that we know that, uh, that aren't here because they're, uh, they don't know how it's going to be to come back. They feel strange about entering in. What's it going to be like? We can invite others. Let me challenge you and me. You think about those two or three people that you would regularly see on your, uh, in your row at the door. You're wondering how they're doing. Call them up. Text them. Invite them. And if you're uh, joining us, I invite you. I'll sit with you. I can even come pick you up if you don't mind getting here at 7 a.m. <laughs> well, if you're too far away, uh, I don't want to make promises I can't keep. But come. Come. He's glad. He's thankful for the ones that invited him. <laughs> and he jumps for joy. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. He hits that surreal moment where he realizes where he is. Our feet are in Jerusalem. Can you believe it? We're here. We're in God's presence. And it's a plural. This, uh, this pilgrimage isn't an individual affair. It's we are here. He's excited to be in the presence. This is better, better than 50-yard tickets at Mosaic, better than front row seats at Shakespeare on Saskatchewan, better than four-day passes at a Disney World, better, better, better. I think sometimes the reason we struggle to come, to gather together to worship it's because we have a thin view of worship. And we have a thin view of the one who is here. The living God. The one who created Jupiter. Who, who, who shaped the Rocky Mountains. Who dug out the Atlantic Ocean. Here. The one who knows you. Who knows every, every atom in your body. Here. Here. And this God wants to be with you. This God is glad that you are in his presence. This God is fired up that you are here. That's what we sang. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us. Let, let me make that personal. For God so loved you. You. Let's just say that together. For God so loved me. Let's put our name in there. Don't say James. Say your name. <laughs> For God so loved James that he gave his son Jesus. This God who made all things knows you and loves you. He wants you to, be, to know him. We enjoy God and... and and we are blessed when we come. Now test me in this. Check it out. God has reserved something of himself that can only be known as we worship together. Let me say that again. God has reserved something of himself that can only be known as we worship together. I know God is everywhere and in all time. But in the beginning, God created a day. And he blessed it. The seventh day. The Sabbath. And you remember it made the big ten. Right? Number four. Keep the Sabbath holy. 
He set these fences around it. Why? Because God hates golf. He hates kids' soccer. Uh, He doesn't like sleeping in. No. Because God wants to be with his people. He wants his people to be with him. And he has something more for us. Blessing. That's how I read it. Something of himself that can only be known as we, get, as we worship together. Now, pragmatically, this is true. Uh, Rebecca McLaughlin, in her book, Confronting Christianity, she cites Harvard studies that uh, show that, um, that uh, people who, who uh, go to a, 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 a regular service, a weekly, once a week or more, on average are happier, healthier, live longer, um, give give more of their money and their time, and uh, don't use drugs, and uh, don't commit crime. This is what she uh, she notices. And she goes so far as to say that making a, a weekly worship pattern in your life is as good for you as quitting smoking or eating more vegetables. Can you imagine on our sign in front? Sunday morning worship, 945, more palatable than a kale smoothie. <laughs> And better for you too. (laughs) Don't do that, Joe. Uh, Andrew said don't do anything crazy while he was away. (laughs) We enjoy God together. See, so so let me uh, let me challenge you. Let me say, make the weekly gathering a priority. Put it down in your day timer. I know it sounds called countercultural. It is. It is. The world will say put in your, your work schedule and then your place schedule and then your personal time, then your spouse, then your family, and then if there's time left, then the uh, community, then the, the worship together. Uh, Stephen Covey will say get your big rocks in place first. Can you think of a bigger rock than God? Than meeting together with him? I know it it, it can sound uh, legalistic. And it can go there. But that's not the story in Psalm 122. And that's not the story from the rest of the scripture. It is glad. People rejoice. It's a party as they gather together. So let me challenge you to that because I believe the Bible and I want what's best for you. All right? Can you accept that? Thanks, Catherine. (laughs) Catherine can accept this. How about the rest of us? Uh, So that's the first point. This is his first point that in worship we enjoy God. All right, the second and third are a little bit shorter. The second, in worship, we embrace family. See, what we see in this middle verse is that uh, we, we enjoy thicker relationships with one another. And we see that we are family. Verse 3, Jerusalem. Built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. Bound firmly together. This is a picture of all the architecture united and unifying. It's one united whole. And this is the same language that was used of the tabernacle. It's pulled together. It pulls together as one. When you have a tent, it pulls together. In a worship service, different people are pulled together into a family. Different people. These different tribes go up, right? 
Judah, Benjamin, Zebulun. They, they all have their uh, particularities. They all have their issues and they have their struggles with one another. But what unites them is they are all tribes of the Lord. And they're going to worship together. That's what unites them. It's not a big family reunion. United to God, they're united to one another. It's not their hobbies, their education, who they cheer for, who they think should be prime minister. Those don't unite them. The Lord, knowing him and following him. And church, let me say, that's what unites us. Jesus. That we are saved by him and that we follow him. There's going to be particularities and issues and whatever else. But if this is the first thing, if this is the main thing, that we are following Jesus together, then we are united as a family. But if it's not, then we're pulling apart. And so, so let me ask you, what's, what's the big thing in your life? In which direction are you pulling? Is it for Menno Simons? For... A Christian nation, inclusivity, world peace, veganism, right? Banning red dye 40. You can get on a lot of different trains and they are headed to different stations. But we are getting on this train that's headed towards Jesus. That's the direction we're going. That's what pulls us together. I say this to us as a church. I say this to our conference. I say this to the Mennonite world gathering. This is our common ground. Jesus. That we are headed for him. That's what unites us in spite of all our particularities and our issues. And we're united as we give thanks. We pull together as we give thanks. Right? As was decreed for Israel, the tribes go up to give thanks to the name of the Lord. That's what they go to do, to give thanks to the Lord. Not to, to get unity. If you aim for unity, you don't achieve it. If you aim for Jesus, unity is thrown in the package. We, we don't go to get prosperity for any other reason. We go to give. See, worship is not about getting, it's about giving. Let me say that again. Worship is not about getting, it's about giving. So to say, I didn't get anything out of today. I didn't get anything from the sermon. I didn't get anything from the songs. No, 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 no. It's not about you. It's not about what you get. It's about what you give. That you are here to give your all. Your best. Did you give your heart? Did you give thanks to the Lord? It's objective and not subjective. See, worship is not about our feelings. We don't give thanks because I'm feeling well. We give thanks to the Lord for what he has done. And that doesn't change. And I want to say, there, there's going to be uh, mornings where you won't be glad uh, in the long run, you will be glad, but in the short run, there'll be mornings where you'd rather call it in. Go down to the river, right? Um, no. Gently, no. We, we gather together to worship, not driven by our feelings. And you know, to follow your feelings is bad advice, right? If somebody is rude to you, you want to punch them in the face. Don't follow your feelings. <laughs> Someone cuts you off. You want to ram them off the road. Don't follow your feelings. Right? We don't follow our feelings. Sociologists will tell us that, uh, that our actions, that our feelings follow our actions. That we can act our way into feeling more than we can feel our way into acting. Right? I, I read a, re a running article um, and this woman said, you know, when it's the day for your 5K run and you don't feel like it, just get out the door and do the 2K. 
Get out the door. And as you're running it, you may feel like doing the rest of it. But just get out the door. And I think that's good advice. Sometimes on those mornings where you don't feel like coming, just get your feet out of bed. Get out the door. Your feelings follow your actions. We go uh, to give thanks. <clears throat> to give thanks, right? And our feelings, uh, and, and giving thanks, it's actually not advice. It's a command. It was decreed for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. And we find again that God's commands are for our good, just like the Sabbath. See, psychologists play catch-up with, uh, with God's word. And uh, they say that this attitude of gratitude is good for you. That, that people who live with uh, giving thanks happier, healthier, more optimistic. And isn't that the case? I find when I give thanks, I, I, I stop looking at all the things that are wrong and all the things that bug me, and I look at what's good and what's right. Uh, and I, I become a grounded optimist, right? Because Jesus loves me and gave himself for me, I have unquenchable hope. Because Jesus lives, I know that my tomorrow will be better than my today. We give thanks. And as we pull together, we do justice. The thrones for judgment were set. The thrones of the house of David. <clears throat> now, the pilgrim looks around in, uh, in Jerusalem and he sees these thrones that are there for judgment, for justice. To put wrongs to right. And he wants this. We all want this. Right? Because we know that there's something wrong in this world. With shootings. And residential schools. And war. And famine. And we know there's something wrong with us. And our prejudice. Our lying. Our hating. And we want justice. And these thrones say that God is going to bring justice. He doesn't just click his tongue. Ah, oh, that's too bad that there's injustice here. That God will one day bring justice. That he will rescue the oppressed. That he will love the orphan. That he will stop the predator. And he invites us to be part of that justice now. The thrones of the house of David. See we're invited into that now. And as we worship. We stand with those. That are different than us. We look at people. Who we wouldn't otherwise hang out with. And we recognize them as sisters. And brothers in the Lord. We start to share our resources. That everyone can have enough. Our justice is imperfect. It's in part imperfect, but it begins. See, in worship, we embrace family. We pull together and we realize just who we are. And that we're called to be a family. And we've received everything from God. And so we challenge our biases. Now if you read your Bible on your own in your paradise uh, garden, in your backyard, sipping your latte, what you're going to do is you're going to miss out. You're going to be, your reading will be conditioned by your cultural lens. Uh, you, you'll be limited by your ignorance. And you won't have anything to challenge your prejudices. That's the way prejudices work. We don't see them. And as we gather together, we become more the family that God has intended us to be. We worship. And as we worship, we embrace family. That's number two. And the third is in worship, we extend peace. 
a small amount of our time in, uh, in, in percentage to the rest of the week, an hour or so. But it changes us. It changes us for the good that we become agents of good. Verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. We pray for peace. We pray because we realize that it is a bigger project than you and I can handle. And so we ask God to bring his peace. Three times here that word peace comes up. And it's that word shalom. So much more than non-conflict. It means a wholeness of life. Harmony. Fullness of relationship. And there's a difference between peace and justice. Justice is good and necessary, but peace, shalom is more. See, it's not an empty courtroom where justice has been served. It's a full banqueting table where everybody's glad to be there. It's not a city where every life matters. It's a family where every child is loved. Shalom. And so we pray, Lord, in your mercy, bring shalom within. I don't know if you noticed it, but that little word is repeated three times as well, within. See, the peace begins within Jerusalem, within those that are gathered. Peace begins within this house, with us. We pray for our sisters and brothers that 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 peace of God, of knowing that Jesus has paid the price for all of our sins, is known by each one of us. We pray that the good gospel of peace would fill our heads, in our hearts, in our hands, Begins here, but it doesn't end here. I will seek your good. See, when we start to pray, our eyes are opened. We start to see things. Actually, we start to look for things. That's seek. It's actively searching out. Where can I do good? Where can we do good? And so we move. And we give a listening ear to a brother. We give a helping hand to a sister. We give a gift card to a family. We seek the good. And as we do that more and more within here, the house is filled with shalom and it floods out the doors. And those that come here see this. They say, I want to be part of this. A place where you can receive love Sign me up. Place for authentic community. That's what our world is hungry for. That's what we get to do here. Right? In worship, we enjoy God. We embrace family. We extend peace. Does that not make you want to come and worship together? Application. It's not rocket science. But what I want to do is I want to turn to actually the New Testament and see in this letter of the Hebrews. Now, uh, Hebrews is written to a family of believers who are stopped meeting together, who are struggling to come together, right? They, uh, they were too busy or discouraged. They were suffering. Uh, they were... Um, pulling apart. And so the author of the Hebrew, uh, to this letter, he writes 
so that they would come together. The first point, look at where you are. Chapter 12 of Hebrews. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You're here. Our feet are standing. Heavenly Jerusalem. To the innumerable angels in festal gathering. To the party. To the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. And to God, the judge of all. And to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Look where you are. It's the party, worldwide, universal. The party that's been going on for eternity past, we are invited to take part in here, to celebrate, to know this. Every Sunday, look where you are. Look, I think we just need a a renovated imagination to see where we really are. That's where it begins. And number two, seek the good. The the author to the Hebrews, he writes in chapter 13, three things. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares, and remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Three things. Keep loving. Keep loving. We're to love one another as family. See, we we don't love one another, holding on to one another as the best friend. But we don't let go of one another as a family member. We keep loving one another. Number two, we keep including. We practice hospitality. If there's somebody here that you don't recognize, somebody in your row, welcome them. Introduce yourself. Take them, uh, take them home for lunch. Take them out to Tien. Get to know them. Share your story with them. Ask them how they met Jesus. You know, in doing so, you might find that, the, that it's actually an angel. Or it may just be a new brother in the family. Keep including and keep caring. Keep caring. Those that are in prison, those that are mistreated, and certainly it means those who are suffering for the gospel's sake around this world. And certainly it means those that are within here who are suffering. Keep calling. Keep praying. Keep inviting. Look. 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 Do you see where we are? Do you see where we are? We're in the presence of the living God. And I am fired up to be here with you. Amen? Amen. Well, let me call up the worship team and close us in prayer. Father, you have invited us into your presence. You have made the way for us, and you say, come. Come. Come as you are, that you know us completely, and you love us unconditionally, and so we can just come. So, Lord, I pray for those here that don't know you, that they may come, they may see who you are, the living God who created all things and who cares for them, who loves them, and they may come to you and surrender to you and join that that worshiping community. And for us that do know you, Lord, that our vision would be renewed, that we would see that we are part 
of a worldwide movement, a universal movement that is transforming, that is changing all things, that is transforming communities, absolutely. Lord, in this week as we go out, that we would know your Holy Spirit goes with us and that we would pray, we would be motivated by our prayers and that we would look to see how we can answer those prayers, how you are calling us to be part of the answer to those prayers. So guide us forward, Lord. We love you. We are thankful that you, have, have, uh, you are with us. Be blessed. Amen.